Well, the weather's been gorgeous, hasn't it, the last few days? We don't expect the temperatures uh, to be what they are at the moment in, the, in well into October. And I guess having had the uh, July and August, which were rather disappointing as main summer, it's good to, uh, to have good weather now. And also, of course, the farmers will be happy because it's easier for them to get their crops in and put away in the barns and so on. Before, as we sang in our first hymn, Come Ye Thankful People, before the winter storms come. And of course, the Lord Jesus used many illustrations from the land around him. Illustrations that the people would know and would be familiar with and would understand. And one that he used fairly often was the picture of harvest. The picture of seed being sown, of growth and fruit being produced. And I guess sometimes we forget, we don't realise that everything, it seems, in nature has a spiritual lesson behind it, a spiritual meaning. God has given witness to his presence. Matthew, um, Romans 1, second half, God makes it clear that we can know that there is a God, that there is a creator, because we see the things that he's made around us. And as we see the picture so often of the, the, the first of the kingdom parables, the parable of the sower, or better, the parable of the soils, that the word of God is the seed that's sown. But it's God who gives the increase. God gives the growth in soil, which represents hearts that he's prepared to receive that. And so it is with the gospel. And the Lord Jesus himself, of course, when in one of the I Ams, the metaphorical illustrations he gave, I am the true vine, John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Illustrations of the, the natural cycle, the cycle of sowing, of nurturing, and of reaping a harvest. And Jesus used this illustration of the fields white, ripe, ready for harvesting as a picture of the world around. He did it, of course, in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well in Samaria. But particularly here, a situation where he got very emotionally and deeply involved himself in the situation. Another illustration that comes from the scriptures all the way through. I picked Ezekiel 34 for the first reading, but we could have used many. Is the picture of the shepherd and his sheep. And one of the illustrations of his people in the Old Testament was that he was their shepherd. And they were the sheep and he provided under shepherds to tend. And we have that, of course, in the New Testament. That ministers, that pastors, that elders, that... Uh, leaders who God's raised up and equipped have a responsibility to tend for and feed the sheep. It's strange, isn't it, that human beings should be regarded as sheep. They're not the most intelligent, not the most um, resilient of creatures. Although I was born in, born in Surrey, my early school days were spent in Derby. And of course, Derby County the local football club, and uh, they, they're known as the Rams. I guess it, we wouldn't expect them to be known as the sheep, would we? Because huh. sheep are silly creatures. Unfortunately, uh, they're, they're, you could argue if you follow football, you'll know that apart from being one of the famous old clubs, that they're now languishing halfway down what would be the equivalent of the old third division, um, League One and not the side that they were. Some might argue that they're playing the game like sheep, rather than, uh, well, we won't go there. But the picture that God uses in his word, and the Lord Jesus uses, shows that our absolute dependence in the way that a sheep, a, a lamb, a, a, and even a, an adult sheep, has to be cared for, has to be provided. I guess the best known chapter in the Bible is Psalm 23. If you ask people, which chapter do you know in the Bible? 
The Lord is my shepherd. Says David, I'm a sheep. I'm dependent on him for everything. I, shan't, I will not want anything. I won't lack anything because he provides all that I need. All that I need spiritually. And of course, the great lesson of scripture is we are dependent on him for everything. Our spiritual food, the food of his word. And in Ezekiel 34, was one of them, we could have picked many, many chapters. Ezekiel and Jeremiah alone between them have several of this illustration of false prophets, false teachers, false shepherds. And the Lord says, I provided these. I provided these. They have a responsibility to care for my people and to tend my people. This is brought, carried forward, of course, to the New Testament. And just in 1 Peter 5 comes to mind, where um, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears that's the Lord Jesus Christ you will receive the unfading crown of glory the same picture the same illustration God has provided shepherds for his flock but as we saw in Ezekiel there the Lord is angry and through the prophet Ezekiel he's telling him to prophesy against the shepherds of Israel his people because they've not fed the sheep. They've eaten the fat. They've clothed themselves. They've got rich. They've exploited God's people. You could say, instead of feeding the sheep, they've fleeced the sheep. And how often this has happened down through the history of the church. And still happening today. And we find God's people starving. In many places, God's people hungry for God's word. When, uh, up until a couple of years before lockdown, when Christine got very ill, as many of you know, with her aggressive cancer, we used to spend um, a couple of months either side of Christmas down in the south of Tenerife, feeding, and, and I was, for the first part of that, I was still working part-time, I'd sold the practice, and patients would come in who'd known me for years, and they'd realised that although I was only part-time, I was missing for a period. And they'd say, oh, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm going to feed the sheep in Tenerife. That was a good opening statement because it got them thinking. Because uh, in all the time we've been there, I don't think we've seen any physical sheep in Tenerife, a rather barren volcanic island. But it was an opportunity. They all knew why I was missing for that, for that period. But the point is, what... A lot of the people we were seeing in the winter were what were known as swallows. Early retirees, retired people, especially from the north of England, from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, who were going to the Canaries to escape the worst of the, of the winter. But many of these folk were from places where there wasn't an evangelical church anywhere in their locality that they could easily get to. And they were going to churches because the local church and they were hungry. And during those, those months, however long they were there, some for a few weeks, some for several months, that they were there, that was when they got their food. Uh, and it was good to see that. But of course, we shouldn't be surprised because didn't the Lord say through Amos, Amos 8, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord but they shall not find it. Surely those days now we're conscious of in this land. How often we drive around and we can't miss the fact that there are buildings which often you can see from the shape of them, the outline of them and you think that was a church or that was a chapel once. If you follow property programmes, 
programs such as Escape to the Country, very often, and it's often the mystery house that they have at the end, is a converted church or chapel turned into a house. Many, of course, are used for offices. One, I remember, we, we spent a couple of days, um, a short break in Bournemouth, and were shocked to walk into, I think it was Bournemouth, and to walk into the town and there see what would have been a big traditional church building, stone building, with banners, pink banners all around it, a nightclub. Anything that purpose that it was built for. And it was the same in Jesus' day. He called out here, the shepherds. When he says in Matthew 9, as he went around, in fact, if we'd read the verse before that, we found or before that, Jesus had cast, had delivered a demon-oppressed man. And he cast the demon out, and the mute man spoke. The crowds marvelled. Verse um, 33 of Matthew 9. Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But, I tell people and in studies I'm leading, I always say, look at, underline the buts in scripture. Because there's something, usually a contrast coming. But, the Pharisees, what did they do? They said he casts out demons by the prince of demons. They were claiming that the Lamb of God, that the Lord Jesus Christ, was using the power of Satan to pass, cast out certain Satan's servants, the demons. It, such is the warped, corrupted mind of man. No, you see, Jesus had said, these were meant to be the shepherds of God's people, the faithful teachers of the truth, those who fed, those who nurtured, those who edified and built up God's people. And they failed. And so, verse 35, where we started, he went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. But verse 36 is where we, we're going to pause for a little while. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, it wasn't that they didn't have shepherds. They had shepherds galore. But those shepherds, as in the Old Testament, were not feeding them with God's word. They were not providing them with the truth. And not only that, but they were failing, I said, failed in the Old Testament to recognise through the prophecies, through the prophets God had sent to them, that the Lord Jesus Christ was the promised and coming Messiah. They didn't recognise him. And therefore they hated him. And as we know, they did everything they could to silence him. And eventually, by persuading the Romans that he was actually going to lead an insurrection, that he talked about having a kingdom, that meant that he was going to overthrow Caesar, overthrow the Roman power and, and control there in Israel. That was a capital offence, and that's how they got him crucified. So Jesus isn't saying you haven't got shepherds. As in the Old Testament, you've got false shepherds. You've got shepherds who are not doing what they should be doing. But notice what his reaction was. He saw the crowds. He saw them harassed. He saw them oppressed by the scribes and the Pharisees and their rulers, their religious rulers. And he had Compassion. The Greek word for compassion there is a very strong word. The nearest definition we would have if we gave it a, a, a contemporary expression, we'd say he was gut-wrenched. You see, at the time, we think of our minds, our thinking being in our heads. And we think of our emotions being in our hearts. They thought their thinking was in their hearts. That's why you read in the Old Testament, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And their emotions were further down. In their kidneys, in their intestines, in their bowels. So basically, it was saying that Jesus was deeply, deeply moved. Our English translations are weak. They give the impression that he just felt a little bit sorry about the situation. It was much, much more than that. 
Here we see the love of the Saviour. We've been looking in um, our group, uh, the group I do online now, on a Tuesday evening through Philippians. And we see Paul there referring to the fact that far from being the the hard-nosed, cold, frozen um, Pharisee that people, ex-Pharisee, that so many people like to make him out to be, that he had a love for the, the folk he visited, the church he planted, the Christians. And how often, when you read through, he says, I exhorted you, I built you up, I cared for you with tears. In Acts 20, when he did his fair, gave his farewell message to the Ephesian elders who he'd served amongst for three years, he said, among you I laboured. I didn't fail. He said, I didn't hold back anything of the whole counsel of God. But he said, I laboured among you, whether individually, from house to house, or whether in public, in public preaching and teaching and lecturing, with tears. And so, of course, did the Lord Jesus, John, 9, uh, John, 19, John 11, at the tomb of Lazarus. We have that short little verse, Jesus wept, filled with compassion when he saw the results of sin. But also, I suspect, when he saw, knowing that at the end of that, that the Jewish leaders would hear of what had happened to Lazarus, they couldn't deny it, and they'd renew their attempt to get rid of him, and to get rid of him. Where he wept also, I think, over the hardness, the wickedness of sin. And of course, we know he wept on his final journey to, to Jerusalem, as he turned around there and he looked across the valley and he saw Jerusalem up on the hill there. And he wept as he knew what was going to happen because they'd rejected him. And he knew that in AD 70, all of that would be totally wiped out. The cities would, as Josephus, Cephas, the historian, tells us, the, knee, the, the streets would be running deep in blood because of the hardness of men and women of hearts that had rejected the word of God and rejected him. And here we have it. This is the son of God. This is the creator of the universe. By him, through him and for him, nothing was made that was made. He is the Lord God Almighty, the God the Son, the second person of the triunity, the Godhead. And he was filled with deep, deep pain and anguish when he saw the situation. The people lost are not hearing God's word. He saw, he had compassion. They were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Look around you. It's like the fields, harvest time. They need harvesting. But there's no one to harvest or very few to harvest. Is that not like our situation in Britain today? We have a nation that's lost. We have, we're told that more young people now, twice as many young people, are having mental health issues than before lockdown. And it's going to get worse. Do you not weep inwardly? Are you not moved down into your very, uh, can I say from the pulpit, guts? Are you not moved deeply with deep compassion and anger, godly anger, when you see the rubbish, the lies that our young people and our children are being indoctrinated with and being confused and mixed up? When you see how this land which was blessed with the gospel, this land which sent missionaries out around the empire and around the world, this land that was so singularly blessed has now rapidly and increasingly, it seems, sought to erase Christianity, God's word, the Ten Commandments, the Maker's instructions. And we're seeing the results. Chaos. Lack of leadership. One thing that's tragic, where is the main lack of leadership? Is it not amongst the professing people? Where are the church leaders who are taking a lead? Just last week, just last week, it took a, a Hindu prime minister to stand up at a conference 
and to state a man is a man and a woman is a woman. It's common sense. You drive into our local hospital down in just a few miles down the road in St Albans, and I was shocked, I was there a, a few weeks ago, to see a huge rainbow painted on the, the, across the road on the main entrance as you drive in. Where are our church leaders standing up for the truth and for God's word? Where is the gospel being faithfully preached? Surely people are lost like sheep without a shepherd. So what's the remedy? What does Jesus say? You've got the situation, but what's the solution? Jesus says, what does he say? Therefore, get organising. Get organising mission. Organise a big campaign. Hire a, get a big marquee or hire a hall, a public hall, the biggest hall in the, in, in the town centre or city centre. Put lots of flyers out. Put a lot of money and advertise. Get a big name evangelist in. And let's give them a nice gospel that will be applicable and make them feel good and get them. He didn't say that. What did he say? Not maybe what we would have expected. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Again, our English translations are weak. The word there, pray earnestly, it's better in the old King James, beseech. The word there means beseech, implore. It's much stronger than just pray. What, how do we pray about the state of our land? How do we pray about the apostasy and the, 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 the false gospel, just the social gospel? In almost the social community clubs, it's hubs that so many of our churches have become. What do we do about that? Do we pray as we should? The first thing to do is recognise we can do nothing. No more than we could give birth to ourselves can we give birth to anyone. We can't open blind eyes. I spent my professional career dealing with people's sight and improving it. I couldn't do for anybody, anything for somebody born blind. And neither can anybody else. It needs a miracle of creation. We're told... Outside of Christ, we're dead, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Only one can give life to the dead. And that's the Lord Jesus. And that's God through the gospel. And so, to pray. But it's not just pray, it's pray earnestly. It's implore, it's beseech. Strong says it has the, impl- in the, the idea of something that you desperately need. Oh, we need the Spirit of God to stir us up, to pray, and to implore, and almost beg the Lord. Not because he's reluctant to do it, but his method is his word. This is, a, this is a, an imperative, this is a command. We can't say we don't know God's will in this situation. We don't know how to pray or what to pray about. He's made it absolutely clear. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Who's the Lord of the harvest? It's interesting looking through the commentators, the older commentators. In a sense, it's both God and the Lord Jesus. Technically, it's God the Father who sent the Son, of course, and threw him the gospel. But if you go on into chapter 10, immediately you find he called the disciples to him, the twelve, and gave them authority and sent them out. But But to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out Send out is a Greek word from ekbalo. It means to thrust out. It's the word that's used in Mark 1 of the, of the Lord Jesus immediately after his baptism. You find that the Holy the Spirit thrust him out into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tried. It's a very strong word. It's pray the Lord of the harvest that he will raise up. If we'd read on in Ezekiel there, if we'd read it, or read it, similar passage in, we could have done in Jeremiah where the Lord says when he's attacking the false prophets who haven't preached he says they're preaching but they, I haven't sent them I haven't called them if they'd spent time in my presence they would have known my word and they would have preached faithfully we need to pray the tragedy the greater tragedy is where are the godly voices in parliament actually there are and if any of you 
the Keswick Convention we didn't go to, but we, we, we listened to a lot of the streams, and you can pick them up. But a lot of it, sadly, was rather disappointing. And you felt they were holding back and not wanting to offend people. Not being prepared to put their heads above the parapet. But Fiona Bruce, the MP, um, gave the Keswick Lecture one of the weeks. And what a testimony. She spoke boldly out. And in the middle of it, she spoke about persecution and so on around the world, because that's her job in the Cabinet. To, she knows what's happening. But in the middle, she gave her own testimony. Boldly, clearly. And she said, there are MPs. We think of Kate Forbes, the SNP um, minister, who uh, narrowly failed to be SNP leader because she stood firmly on God's word and biblical principles. We need to pray for our MPs. We need to pray that the Lord will raise up, thrust out people in the public sphere, but especially in the church. How's the church going to be made alive again? When God sends up, raises up men who are sat in his presence, who will boldly say like Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. God, so help me God. So Jesus said, here's the solution. The harvest, the fields are ripe. Many, many are crying out, is there hope? There is a hope. By God's grace, we know the hope. We have the hope contained in this book. This book, which is alive and active, it's not like any other book. It's the book through which God, the Holy Spirit, brings life. That is the gospel. Paul, writing to the Romans, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why not? Because it is the power of God. I'm not. The gospel itself the word of God's powerful and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We mustn't lose confidence in God. But the good news is, and I love Philippians 1, verse 6, and those who are on, a, on a, I know Andy joins us sometimes, and he always gets the recordings that Christine sends out. If anyone would like, would like them, then let Christine know. Give her your email address and you can have them. But Philippians 1, 6, where Paul, writing to this church, he loved... And he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we're tempted to feel, is there hope? And to feel, and sometimes the devil wants to doubt, tempt us to doubt. But if God's begun a good work in you, it's his work. And the seed he's sown into hearts he's prepared is guaranteed to come to harvest. So don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. Don't be disheartened. Don't let the evil one who says, it's hopeless. The church is going to die out in this land. No, it's not. There have been great times in history, and you look at the history, you find times of declension when God has raised up people. The Reformation during the Puritans, a century later, the Great Awakening, the um, Victorian Missionary Age, we need to pray him that he will do it again for his glory. Amen.